getting there <laughs> just another two minutes <laughs> everything's very slow on this end okay here we go pause and mute it okay great so um welcome to the introduction to science topics with bobby farley's rubio um we're here again live from the fairbanks museum and excited to give you another uh, chance to look at the night skies. It's a little cloudy today, but hopefully in the next few days, maybe it'll clear up and you'll get to see some of these uh, very cool constellations and other things that Bobby will be discussing. Um, so without further ado, I will hand it over to Bobby. <laughs> all right, well, it's good to see you, all you folks and hear your voices again, but um, I want to remind you that one of the benefits of this live internet uh, interaction that we have is that you can ask questions. And I really, really, really uh, miss that part of our classes because I think when we were in the same room together, you kids were really good at generating a lot of questions and we could go in all different directions. So I want you to remember that, especially since next week is our last session together. So in addition to whatever questions you come up with now, I want you to think about over the next week, uh, any topics or any questions that you would like for me to answer that we haven't covered in our classes. So maybe the last session will be a sort of a smorgasbord of different topics. But the point is, I, I want to hear your questions. I want to make sure that all of you who participated this whole year are going to get as much as you want and as much as you need out of this program. So I'm only here to benefit you. So make sure you ask the questions that you need answered about any topic in science, not just the astronomy that we've been covering. However, that's what I'm planning on covering today to keep you uh, updated on your constellations. I was gonna switch to the Northern sky, but of course, anything that we've talked about in the past, we talked about Virgo, we've talked about Leo, we've talked about Orion and the dogs and Gemini. So on any of these constellations that came up, if you have a question about them, please ask anything is appropriate for the stars and any other subject too, because we are sadly running out of times that we get to meet with each other. So make sure you take advantage of this chance to ask live questions. I'm gonna move to Stellarium now, and I'm pretty sure you've all become familiar with Stellarium by now. Well, let me ask, how many of you have actually gotten to use it? Uh, many, uh, did any of you actually figure out any cool tricks like I asked you to, or uh, maneuvers that you can use Stellarium to do? Yes, I have. It's quite interesting. All right. Who's that? Is that Seamus? Yeah. yeah. Cool. Well, um, yeah, there, there, there are so many ways that you can use it, including taking you to different parts of the world and showing you what the sky would look like from a completely different latitude, which is something that I also will probably do too today. It looks like we're getting a, yeah. So yeah, use that chat and, uh, Lila will let me know if uh, anybody needs a question answered, but I'm going to move on now to Stellarium. So let's see. Right now, I, I set up Stellarium so that it has all the labels turned off. That's an option that you can play with in uh, the configuration windows. There's so many options. You can totally change how the program works through all of this. I haven't even uh, scratched the surface of all the things that you can do. So there I hit the sun and you hit the space bar. It centers automatically on whatever object you've clicked. Ah. Ah, Seamus asked the great question that I could uh, answer now. Has anyone made a map of what the sky would look like on exoplanets? You know that I have not seen anybody do that yet. And I think that that would be an awesome thing to do because it's actually possible with the data that we have to know where the stars would be from an exoplanet surface. So uh, one of the most fun things I can do in the planetarium I cannot do here, unfortunately, is that if we zoom away from the solar system and zoom out into the galaxy, you can see familiar constellations like Orion uh, fall apart. They get discombobulated 
because you'll realize that those stars only look like that shape given the perspective that we have. And that was a big topic of last week, which was to remember that we live on a moving platform and our unique perspective on the constellations is also unique to the solar system. Even if you were to go over to Sirius, which is only nine light years away, all of our constellations will look a little weird, a little strange. They would be like twisted or distorted. But to answer your question, Seamus, I have not seen any resource made like that. It would take a lot of data crunching to do it, but I think it would be so awesome. And I highly recommend you either try that or look for one and let us know if you find any, anybody who's already done something like that. Um, I remember the first time I learned of this was when I was a kid reading uh, Carl Sagan's Cosmos, which was the book version of the TV show that he did and was redone more recently by Neil deGrasse Tyson. And in that, they showed how the proper motion of the stars, which may be a new term for you, the stars themselves are moving through the galaxy. And so eventually, over thousands of years, constellations will look different, not because you know, the earth has moved, but because the stars that we look at will have moved relative to each other. And he predicted that in the future, the Big Dipper would look like the radio telescope, which is actually kind of appropriate because that would be an ancient object in the future to the people who would see the stars rearranged in a new way. So that's something that I've thought about since then, but let's get on to tonight's sky because the Big Dipper is something I wanna talk about. So if you remember Stellarium has that clock and I've just pressed the L key twice and now every second, every minute is a second long. If I hit L one more time, then we can really see the earth spinning to put the sun out of view. And just in the last couple of weeks, some of the main stuff that we're gonna see in the sky hasn't changed very much. Like for the fact that Venus is still gonna be the brightest object in the sky and the moon, which was full last time we were talking about the pink moon now is going to be a quarter moon it won't even be rising until after midnight it's actually a waning crescent now which means for the next couple of weeks you have very dark skies at night this is something to take advantage of like if you have a telescope you'll be able to see things that would otherwise be washed out by the moon's light and uh, uh, even without a telescope this is a great time to look for those distant objects that are very hard to see uh, like you know, the constellation Virgo, where a lot of her stars were too faint to see with the full moon. Now would be a great time to learn how she looks. But there's Venus, lovely Venus. And you remember how Venus went right in front of the Pleiades last time we were talking about it? Well, look how far it's drifted now from where the Pleiades are. And you might notice that Orion is looking very close to the horizon. And that's because we're in the last month when we can see him. So soon, you won't see that picture in the sky, but Venus will continue to move away from the Pleiades. So Venus is gonna be visible for a lot longer than Orion is. So we talked about that a lot, but if you have questions about this, please let me know. But I wanna shift our view over towards the North. In the North are constellations that you can see every night of the year. I know that some of you probably already know them, but I'm gonna cover this, you know, just assuming you've forgotten a lot of what we've talked about in the past, given that we're looking at it in a new way. But one thing I would like to see if I could find in Stellarium is the marker for something that's called the circumpolar circle. And if you look right here, you can see it on the right-hand side. That circumpolar circle, well, it sounds funny, it's fun to say, but think of what it means, circum, is around like circle, circulate around like uh, Buddha circumambulated the Bodhi tree. And if what's in the center of that circle, does anybody notice what's dead center in that circle? Yes, circum around polaris, circumpolar. But this is a circle that is based on your latitude. So if you lived farther uh, north, you would actually have a bigger circumpolar circle. And if you live farther south, you have a smaller circumpolar circle. And what this means is the stars that are always visible in your sky too. Because if you think about spinning this view, no matter how much you spin that circle, all those stars are gonna stay above the horizon. So winter, summer, spring, or fall, the stars inside of this circle are visible to us at our latitude. And I have this set to my latitude here in Barnet, Vermont, 
So anybody who's in Vermont or even Northern New England is gonna be close enough that this is more or less the same, but it varies by latitude. So here's why I put up the circumpolar circle. There's something that's always visible because it's always inside of our circumpolar circle. But growing up in Miami, Florida, when I was a kid in Hialeah, Florida, the Big Dipper was actually invisible during parts of the year because we were so far south that the plate, the, sp the, the space below the North Star that you're seeing now was less. And so there was a time when the Big Dipper would disappear from sight and I could not see it all year round. So it was kind of a nice, funny surprise for me to move from that Southern tropical latitude where Florida is almost tropical, subtropical, they say, to where I live now, where I have stars that are that are visible all the time, including the Big Dipper. So, Big Dipper. Let's hear from some of you if you remember any of the other names for the Big Dipper. Drinking Gourd. The Drinking Gourd, yes. The stars that led many thousands of slaves to freedom during the time of the Underground Railroad. And that is actually probably where the you know, Big Dipper concept came from. Drinking gourd brought from Africa with West African cultures and worked its way into the rest of American culture. And now Big Dipper drinking gourd, to me, they mean the same thing. But any other name? Ursa Major. Ursa Major, right. The Big Bear. So I put up the line so you can see that the Big Bear is bigger than the Big Dipper. So I think we talked about this before, that unfortunate word asterism. Ugh. The Big Dipper is an asterism, but Ursa Major is the official constellation. But has anyone heard any other versions of this bear from me before? Some of you may have heard it in the past. I'm gonna take that circumpolar circle out so that we get a clearer sky. I'm gonna take the highlight off of Venus. So, I wanna hear if any of you remember any of the other stories I may have told you about this bear in the sky. I'm trying to get it. It's gonna be hard to make them not upside down. <laughs> uh, there it is. If you were standing outside in a field trying to do this, you'd probably fall over. I twisted myself all the way around. It's like blood rushing to my head. Okay, well, let's look at the bear. I can put up the illustration. But that might give you a guide. But remember that the Big Dipper is the rear end of the bear. And in my imagination, here's the bear's nose, here its eyes, here its ears. So that group of stars makes a nice head. And here is the chest and the front leg with the little sharp claws on the front sharp. claw. Here's the belly of the bear, his little belly button, and his long hind leg. So, yes. You've probably heard me say it before. You don't want that soup from the Big Dipper because the scoop is the bear's big butt. So be careful where you, uh, you know, what you use to eat with. However, this big bear has three stars back here. And that's the handle of the Big Dipper. But it's kind of something that messes up the picture of the bear. I wonder if anybody has heard any way to describe those stars in another form. Long tail. Yeah, that is the Greek and Roman story. And Taylor, do you remember the story of how that happened? Yes, I do. I remember how that long tail happened. Do you remember anything else about that bear story? That, that bear used to be a queen. Yes. So you remember the story of the, the ancient Greek myth of Callisto one of uh, Zeus's many victims, you could say, uh, victims of his uh, fascination with mortal women. And she ended up being turned into a bear by Hera and got tossed into the sky. But when Zeus threw her in the sky, he used her tail as a handle and that got stretched out. And that's where the famous Greek story comes from. But you have, have none of you heard any other stories about this bear from me? Oh, it's quiet. Okay. Well, sort of uh, continuing a theme that we started last week, I wanted you to know that other cultures around the world have seen things in these stars and the bear that you see in Ursa Major is very similar to a bear that has long been part of the folklore of many of the American Indian nations of the Eastern woodlands. 
And this includes the native people of Vermont, the first Vermonters, the Abenaki people. But the story that I'm gonna tell you about this bear isn't just from the Abenaki culture. Uh, it's actually a story that's known through many of the cultures of, throughout Canada and on the East Coast of the United States, the native people. Oh, sorry, we're not talking about Canis Minor this time, sorry. But, no, the, the story of the bear is well known to all of the cultures that spoke languages of the Algonquian uh, you know, language group, which includes the native people of New York City, like the Leni Lenape people, and includes the people who, where Pocahontas lived, the Powhatan people of Virginia, who uh, met John Smith to great fame. However, this is, so think about that. This is a story that comes from <laughs> dozens, if not hundreds of different Native American societies. They've all heard this story. This story worked its way up and down the coast and across Canada, who knows how many centuries ago. And it's a story about a bear, but this bear does not have a long tail. The bear in this story resembles the bear from the Greek and Roman stories, except for the tail part. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Yes, I do. The yes. bear was chased by three hunters. Ah, <laughs> you're right. Well, in other versions of the story, it's more than three hunters. But the three hunters that I told you about are the three that never give up. And that actually is a funny part of the story because it returns to that concept of the circumpolar circle. You see, if you lived in Vermont or in the Northeast, you would have noticed that these other stars are associated with being hunters too, but they're not inside the circumpolar circle. So those hunters would disappear from the sky for part of the year. And in the story, it was like they were giving up and they were, you know, discouraged, but the three dedicated hunters never stopped chasing the bear. Uh, and that's kind of funny because the three dedicated hunters are the ones that you can see all year round. And the other ones that are less dedicated disappear for part of the year. So in a way, that story from the Abenaki Nation incorporates the concept of the circumpolar circle in a funny way. And in another way, the circumpolar circle that I'm showing you is actually the path that this bear walked through the sky. So in, uh, in the story of the Abenaki folks, this constellation is called Kitsi Awasos. And just for fun, I'm gonna type it in the way that I've seen it spelled out, which is of course uh, all phonetic. But here I'm writing in the chat, the way I've seen it spelled out, Kitsi means big, and awasos means bear in the Abenaki language. And the picture of the bear is more or less the same, but these three hunters actually have names and I may not have told you their identities. Does anybody remember any information? Now these stars are known by their Arabic names, Alioth, Mizar, and Al-Qaid. But this in the story from the Abenaki folks, this is the first hunter, the second hunter, and the third hunter. Did anybody remember that they have identities? Or did anybody hear anything about that? Well, I'm gonna put a highlight on Alioth, which is the first hunter. In the Abenaki stories, this first hunter is the one closest to the bear. He's the best hunter, he's the swiftest, he's the closest to catching it. And he's actually the kind of bird that you might see outside your window right now trying to hunt worms on your front lawn? A robin. A robin, exactly. So the second hunter is a bird that is less swift than the robin hunter, but is well prepared to turn this bear into a meal. This is a bird that spends so much time around people that it has learned how to cook recipes. And uh, you can think about that for a second. I want to show you something really cool about this. Do you guys remember this part of the star? Check it out. What do you see? Two. These two Five stars eight. are so close together that if you have any eye problems, any vision problems, anything less than 2020, you probably won't be able to see it. And you may remember that I told you Genghis Khan used this as an eye exam for his cavalry back in the times of the Mongolian Empire. But for the Abenaki folks, this is the second hunter. The star known as Mizar is actually a chickadee in the Abenaki story. See, chickadees do spend a lot of time around people. 
if any bird was ever going to learn how to cook a recipe, it'd probably be a chickadee You're flying by my kitchen window every day. And in the stories, that little tiny star is chickadee's campfire. And that star has, is known by its Arabic name, Alcor. Well, not to get too confused with the Abenaki story versus the Arabic names, which come from a very different culture. Mizar, from what I understand, is a word for horse and Alcor means the rider. So if you, in a sense, you can see the bright horse and the little dim rider on top. That's how the Arab scholars remembered those stars. But for our story in the Abenaki tradition, this is the chickadee and that's his little cooking fire. He's got a campfire burning. He's ready to boil up some bear stew. If only the robin brings home the meat. So there's the first hunter. There's the second hunter and the third hunter. Does anybody know who that might be? Well, this is a bird that I would love to encounter myself, but I've yet to have a close encounter with the bird that's known as the gray jay. Have any of you out there heard of gray jays before? No. Whoa. Yes, I have. I, I've seen them. You have? Yeah. Okay, great. Well, what, what do you know I'm about gray jays? Here. Is that Seamus? What do you know about gray jays? Not much. I went through a bird watching phase, though, and I saw one. Where, saw where one. did you see it? Do you remember what town it was in? It was in Bradford. I was just walking down a street, and it was in a tree. Well, that's fortunate. Uh, they're hard to find bird. They're not, nothing nearly as common as our blue jay. But the gray jay, the best place to find them from what I've heard, I have a friend named Tom Berryman who's taken many pictures of them in Victory Bog. And Victory Bog is way up north, uh, up north of Burke. And uh, in, it's in a, a hollow of, in the mountains where you see a lot of Arctic birds and even wildlife like the spruce grouse, things that don't really exist in the rest of Vermont because they come from the boreal forest up north in Canada. So there's like a pocket of a different habitat in, in uh, Victory. If you ever get a chance to hike the Victory Wildlife Management Area, uh, you will see a lot of cool stuff. And it's also the part of Vermont that has the greatest number of bobcats and moose. Unfortunately, the moose numbers are probably very low because of winter tick. But anyway, I don't want to get too distracted. That's where you can go see a gray jay reliably from what I've heard. And the gray jay has a funny ha uh, habit that is appropriate for this story because in the story that I heard, this third hunter, he's far behind the other two because he's lazy. He is waiting for them to do all the hard work. He wants Robin to kill the bear. He doesn't have to get his hands dirty. He wants Chickadee to cook the bear so he doesn't have to worry about getting firewood or all that. He has a plan to show up at the camp just in time for when the stew is all done. And the only job he has to do is slurp up the food. So now gray jays in real life have a reputation for being bold uh, with people and they are known to steal food out of people's hands. I've actually heard stories from people who had granola bars or chocolate bars or peanuts in their hand they were eating and a gray jay landed on their hand and took that food and flew right away. So I if that's- How do that to me in Massachusetts? Could he do that to you? Yeah, with sunflower seeds. <laughs> You must have been sitting very still. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, chickadees can do that too, but they're usually more cautious. So if you're sitting really still, a chickadee might just perch on you. I have that happen frequently only because I have a big bird feeder on my porch and I sit right next to it. And if I sit lo still long enough, that can happen. But a gray jay is different because it goes, it swoops into a person that is not sitting still in the middle of walking. It has a bravery level that's much higher than other birds. But you could also interpret that behavior as sort of a laziness. It doesn't want to work hard to get the food. It wants to steal it from others. So I think that's a pretty funny attribute to give to this hunter and that he's named after the gray jay because of that gray jay's behavior. So there you have this motley crew of hunters chasing the bear, the robin, the chickadee, and the gray jay. And they chase this bear no matter where it roams through the sky. And that's literally true because of the circumpolar circle. As the seasons change, you'll always see the bear and the three hunters. So it's like a never ending story. But has any of you, have any of you heard any parts of the story? Because this is also connected with our seasonal change in another way. I might have to uh, do a little, uh, uh, you know, cheating with Stellarium to make some of this clear. 
Actually, I can just change the date. So how about that? We'll go month by month. So think of this as a story that I'll, that takes a whole year to tell, but I'll be, you know, summing up in a few minutes. So there's where we see the bear in the spring, right? And in the real world, our bears are just starting to wake up. So it's a kind of a cool connection with this bear that at the time when the bears are waking up, this bear is far from the earth. But as you'll see over the next few weeks, let's jump a month into May. See what happens? First of all, the days are getting longer. So at this time, at nine o'clock in May, it'll still be bright out. So I might have to jump to another hour, like 10 o'clock when it'll be dark all the year round. Okay, look at where the bear is now. In May, when the flowers start to bloom, this bear's nose is pointed towards the earth. It's heading down to the ground. And then in June, can you see where it is now? It's heading straight for the earth. In July, you can see that its front legs start to reach the earth. And then in August, it looks like it's walking on the ground. And in September, there you'll see it in the evening around 10 o'clock, you'll see it looking like it's walking through the ground. So think about the fact that we've gone six months roughly or, or a little more, actually let's go six months all the way to October there. Now it's fall and the bear that was at the top of the sky in the middle of the spring is now on the earth during the time when bears are eating the most. In the fall is the time when the bears are trying to fill their bellies with acorns, beech nuts, whatever seeds they can find and also whatever berries that were available during the summer, they've pigged out on all this stuff. And that's the time in the fall when a bear gets to be its fattest. It is a time when hunters are most likely to want to hunt them and need to hunt them. And also something cool happens in the sky at this time. If you're up on the nights starting in September, but more obviously in October, watch what happens as the night goes on. I'm gonna speed up the clock a little bit and you can see what happens with the bear. So if you stayed up from like 10 o'clock to 11 o'clock on an October night, you would see the bear look like it's standing on the ground and then suddenly, what's it doing now? It's rising up on its hind legs. You still see the shape of the bear? Look at the front claw. It's raised up in the air. You don't have to come visit the Fairbanks Museum and look at our Kodiak bear to know that when a bear stands up on its hind legs and has his claw sticking out, it looks extremely dangerous and extremely scary. And according to the story from the Abenaki folks, it is at this time when the bear stands up on his hind legs that the first hunter, Robin, shoots the bear with an arrow. And then that giant bear in the sky bleeds. And guess what happens on the ground? Come on, take a guess. All this, all this blood from the bear rains down from the sky and it makes the trees turn red. Yes, I heard somebody whispering that to their child's ear, but that's okay. Yes, the trees get red. Okay, so I don't think that anybody in the Abenaki Nation, when they were telling this story, literally believed that bear blood was raining down from the sky, tinting the leaves in the forest. But that story is a great way to remember where the bear is in the fall and what's going on in the story. It's sort of a mnemonic device, but at the same time, it matches the rhythm of the seasons. The bear stands up on his hind legs and the fall, the bear gets shot. And then just like the real bears, as we go from fall into winter, look what happens to the bear in November. It's not even on the ground anymore. And then December is climbing higher and higher. And of course, as we go to January and February, you get the point. The bear goes around the circle. And it's during the winter months when it's disconnected from the earth. And during the summer months when it's walking on the ground. So this constellation story has a rhythm that matches the seasons. And, uh, and it's also a practical thing because all of a sudden you realize that this circumpolar circle is like a seasonal clock. And you can tell what time of year it is just based on where the constellations are. And just as a, a, 
I'm going to go back to tonight's guy. We're almost in February of next year. So we've gone a, quite a bit into the future. But does anybody see a connection with another constellation that you could use by drawing a line with the Big Dipper? Oh, I should have covered this a little better, but who's that? Somebody speak up. Oh, that's Cassiopeia. Yes, Cassiopeia is always on the opposite side of the North Star from the Big Dipper. So when you put these two constellations together with the North Star right in between them, you have this nice star clock. It's like a calendar made of stars and you'll be able to predict what's gonna be in the sky just by knowing what season it is based on remembering the details of this story. So I think you'll realize that this story is not just a story, it's sort of a practical breakdown of how the sky works encoded into a story so that it's easier for people to remember. And I think a lot of the stuff that we talk about in the sky is that kind of story. I don't think that everybody in ancient times believed all of these myths literally to be true. I think they always had an understanding that sometimes a story was just made to help it become easier for someone to remember uh, important details. So does anybody have any questions about this great story? Let me go uh, return us to now, bright daytime, and then we'll go into tonight again. But I wanna see if there's anyone else who has a question about this story. It's pretty cool that this story was so widespread. You know, just so you know, the different people who knew this story all spoke different languages. They had a cultural root, but you know, this was, us. I don't know what the bear was called in other languages. I just know its name in Abenaki. That we're looking north. So let's go look west. I can make another beautiful sunset for you guys here in Stellarium. Now, please, please ask questions. I missed the interaction with you guys. So if you have a question about this, here we are again tonight in the evening sky and let's looking north. Let's let the sun set. Let's see where the bear is now. Just about the top of its path in the circle, just before it starts to head down towards the earth, it must be smelling the blooming flowers. So another thing to remember that should never leave your mind about the north. Oh, oh, that's an excellent question. Uh, Seamus, Cassiopeia, as far as I know, is not connected to the bear story. And I have not heard any specific story from the Abenaki folks or any other nation about uh, Cassiopeia, but there, there are 535 different American Indian nations in the United States. And that's so many cultures. There's gotta be stories about it. I just haven't run into them. And I only have one reliable source book that I've used for learning these constellations. It's called Stars of the First People by Dorca S. Miller. So. If I had all the time and funding in the world, I would love to travel around the country and collect as many of these stories as possible. That would be my uh, you know, bucket list mission to get those stories well known. But unfortunately, a lot of these stories just haven't left the cultures that uh, told them. And sadly, a lot of these stories get lost through time because a lot of native cultures are running out of native speakers of their language. And when a language goes extinct, it's, it's, it's as culturally devastating as when a species of nature goes extinct. You lose an understanding of that culture and how to see the world through the eyes of people who may have lived in the same place for thousands of years. So the loss of stories and the loss of languages are closely connected. And in America's native cultures, that is a major problem right now. Um, I know that there's groups like the Navajo that are using uh, companies like Rosetta Stone and Duolingo to try to, in fact, Duolingo has a Navajo in it. So if you want to help uh, learn a language that could disappear, you can do so at home right now. So maybe one day they'll have Abenaki on Duolingo. I know that Middlebury College, now thanks to a, a, an Abenaki man named Jesse Bowman Bruchak who's teaching uh, the lessons, they have a language program there. Uh, it's the priority is for members of the Abenaki nation get first dibs on the class, but I imagine in the future, some of you may be able to enroll and it would be so cool if many Vermonters were able to speak the language of the first Vermonters to preserve that language and then to preserve the stories and the culture that come along with a, a rich tradition that is a language. 
But Big Dipper, Big Bear, Kitsiawasos, and most importantly of all, that pair of stars that is the bear's belly button and its back or the scoop end of the Big Dipper. If you draw a line through them, I, I, I know I've said this so many times, but I just want to make sure everybody remembers that that line always points you towards the North Star and then you can continue on to Cassiopeia. So to answer Seamus's question in another way, do you guys remember we talked a little bit about Arcturus, that constellation, I mean, uh, Boötes and the star Arcturus right here? Who remembers the picture I told you to make with that star and its constellation? Booties, Boötes, El Boyero in Spanish, which means the ox herder. Anybody remember? Ice cream cone. <laughs> Come on, that's my promise to you guys. I will have ice cream someday. I thought you would all remember that. Oh, I so remember. I want to. What's that? I remember that promise, and I remember that that was the ice cream cone. Oh, I'm sure. I, I have no doubt that you remember the promise. I'm sure I'm going to have to keep that promise for, with you guys. I'll let you pick the flavors. However, let's focus here. The ice cream cone, Boötes, and Arcturus, that super bright star. Do you remember what's right below Boötes? Uh, I'll give you a hint. This star is called Gemma, which is the right thing to have on this kind of device that you might want to wear. Does anybody remember Corona Borealis? I feel like the it was the crown, maybe? Yeah. Co <laughs> I, I'm sorry to bring up the word Corona now. <laughs> yes. yes, Corona Borealis is the northern crown. And I wanted to add this to the Abenaki story because if you look at where the bear is and you look at where the crown is, it looks like a hole or a, a, an opening. And in the Abenaki story, that is the lodge. That is the, the hibernating place for the bear. That is where its den is. So look at Corona Borealis as the bear's hiding place. And it actually looks like it walked out of it into the sky. So it has a cool relationship right there where, where you can see that. And interestingly enough, that lodge becomes visible in the spring what are the real bears doing in the spring? They're leaving their dens. So this is pretty kind of a cool part of the story where those little details add to the richness of the story. And that is a constellation that is really easy to see, Corona Borealis. It just looks like that little semicircle. You'll notice it right away, right next to the ice cream cone. And I know you're probably wondering about Hercules. Well, Let's just say Hercules is a little heartbreaking of a constellation. It's, it just looks like a keystone. So pretend that's his big pecs and there's his narrow waist. And you can imagine a six pack abs right there. And that's, that's how I see Hercules, just <laughs> a torso. <laughs> if you wanna see the rest of it, it's difficult to see, but H.A. Ray's version in the stars is probably the best one, but that is not an easy constellation to see. So let's return over to our Northern view. Oh, speaking of, uh, I just had an idea that popped into my head just for a totally different perspective from a totally different culture. I want to see if you guys remember what we're looking at now and see if you recognize which constellation is in my view. It won't be easy, but maybe you'll notice that there are Oh, sorry. I was I was giving you guys bad directions. Here we go. Does anybody recognize what we're looking at? Think of the fact that the top of the picture is two stars that are almost identical. Gemini twin. Gemini. Gemini twin. Yes, you're looking at the Gemini constellation. Yes, good job, everybody. Yes, if you guessed Gemini, you got it right on the nose. But that is a different picture to different peoples. So I want you to now imagine Gemini not as being a pair of brothers, but as being a weird land formation, something that is actually very unique to the United States. Have you ever heard of a place called Devil's Tower? Mm -hmm. Yes, we're going there this year. 
Yeah. Oh, please take pictures. I've, I've, I, I will one day make it there. But ever since I was a kid and I saw the movie Close Encounters of the Third Kind, I've wanted to go to this place. And I'll send you pictures. Oh yeah. Well, look at look at how the Gemini constellation. If you imagine these two twin brothers' heads instead as being the top of that famous land formation, let me just pull up the Google search that I did for this and show you what Devil's Tower looks like if you've never heard of it before. See how it has that flat top and it's like a, a column of rock. It's a very strange rock formation. It's actually a plug of igneous rock that was a volcano. It came out of a volcano, but then the rest of the volcano eroded away and it left behind this core of frozen lava. So that's why it looks so weird. It was molded by a volcano and then the volcano is gone. But that place is a very important place to many Native American cultures. I'm gonna put it back to Stellarium, see if you can, now that you know what Devil's Tower looks like, can you vaguely see it here? Especially the flat top and the vertical, nearly vertical sides. So for the Lakota people and other Plains nations, this is called Bear Lodge. Um, and there's a lot of stories about a giant, magical, sacred, mysterious bear that lives inside of that. And one of the parts of the story that I thought it was cool is that the reason why that tower looks so strange is because the bear clawed it with his claws, carving those fluted sides. So it's pretty cool to think of a bear scratching its way, you know, up uh, onto this uh, amazing tower. But however you explain its existence, if you lived in Wyoming or anywhere in the Great Plains, this would be a unique landmark it would certainly get your attention and any culture that saw it would want to uh, memorize it, uh, memorialize it in a story of some kind. So pretty cool. I can't wait for you folks to go see Devil's Tower. I can't wait to see the pictures, but uh, let's get back to Stellarium here. So just think of how many more stories we might find about the Gemini constellation or Ursa Major or anything else in the sky we only know a tiny sliver of the ancient stories that were made up uh, uh, you know, about these things. And who knows, just think for a moment, how these stories got started. Who was the first person to say that this was Devil's Tower or the Bear Lodge? It was probably a storyteller sitting by a campfire telling his folks, his family, or her, her family, her, her children, something cool that she imagined in the sky and somebody imagined it and it became such a popular idea that it's been preserved for thousands of years. The concept of a meme is exactly the same thing, except that I say if constellations are the oldest memes, the original memes. <laughs> well, I, so is it, does anybody have any questions? Now, I wanted to uh, just round off some of the things that we're talking about with the northern sky. So if you remember Cassiopeia, then you probably remember the constellation Andromeda, which is the home of the Andromeda galaxy. But unfortunately, as, I, as you'll see as I take these things out, the F, the G, and the A, fog, atmosphere, and ground, um, that constellation Andromeda is out of sight for us right now. See, there's the ground, there's Andromeda. So at this time of year, if you want to see the Andromeda galaxy, you have to wait till like, you know, three o'clock in the morning when she appears over here. It's actually 3.30. And then you have a chance to see Andromeda's galaxy. So it's not circumpolar Andromeda's galaxy. It's just outside of that circle. And that will hopefully explain to you why you can't see it all the time. There's the galaxy just on the edge. But where would you have to live to be able to see Andromeda's galaxy all the time? What direction would we have to move in order to fix that so that this galaxy is inside of our regional circumpolar circle? 
want to, who wants to take a crack at that question? Further south. Further south? Okay. North. North. Okay, we have a debate now. We have a discussion and a debate. So how about uh, we try both of those? Now, let's see, I'm gonna go to where I can see latitude and longitude here in Stellarium, which is uh, where, uh, let's see, that's under the location window. Okay, so check it out, our latitude, let's see if we can see it at the same time. Our latitude, where I live in, in Barnet, Vermont is 44 degrees in 28 minutes. Okay, we don't, we just go with the degrees. So let me lower that. If I go south, the latitude number goes down. Let's see what happens. Well, let's go faster than one degree at a time. There, uh oh, uh oh, what's happening to our circle? I'm now south of Cuba. Yeah, look at what happens. So what happens if I go to the equator? Oh no. Two things have happened that you may have noticed. What happened to the North Star? <laughs> Dear. It, if we're at zero degrees latitude, guess what? The North Star is zero degrees up in the sky. Now at the risk of getting too many things in the view at the same time, let me see if I can put up the meridian line. The meridian is the line that cuts the sky in half from north to south, bisecting that. And if you can, well, you can't see it because it's right behind the end, but Polaris would be right on that line. Unfortunately, this line doesn't have the degrees marked on it like we do in our planetarium. But have you ever seen uh, sailors in movies or in old books using a device called an astrolabe? or a sextant. These are devices that were meant to measure the angle of a star above the horizon. And the most likely star you would use would be the North Star. Because if you went up to, let's go, oh, hold on, let's go a couple degrees time. Okay, there's the North Star. If I'm at eight degrees north latitude, my astrolabe or my sextant would read that this was eight degrees above the horizon. And if I go up to, let's say the latitude of Havana, Cuba, right around there, you would know that because you would see that the North Star is about 23 degrees above the horizon. But do you remember what our latitude is here? So was it Four? There, 44, awfully close, awfully close to 45. Does anybody have an inkling as to why that would be an important number? What would happen? What's that? What does 45 mean when it comes to the latitude scale? Think mathematically. Can I, What's can that? I say something? Yeah, please. The 44th parallel, like the 44 line on the globe, it cuts right through our backyard. Whoa. That's so cool. Oh. So did you know what the 45th parallel is? Um, somewhere else in Vermont, I assume. It's a very particular place. In fact, you can't just cross it right now if you want to. Border. Oh, is it the Canada border? Yeah, exactly. Oh. So the Canadian border with Vermont was originally drawn to be exactly 45 degrees north latitude, but that was a, uh, a decision that was made in the 1800s. And then when they uh, got better at measuring latitude, they realized that they actually messed up and they moved the line. And that is why towns like Derby Line, Derby Line are cut in half where part of the town is in Canada and part of the town is in the United States. Originally, the whole town was in the United States. And then they realized, um, <clears throat> excuse me, pardonnez-moi, uh, this border, is actually a little farther south than you thought it was. And they're like, oops. So they had to redraw the border and it basically cut right through the middle of a town, of several towns, like Bead Plain and Derby Line are two towns in Northern Vermont that lost a little bit of territory to Canada when they adjusted the 45th parallel. So think about how funny that kind of story might be. Wow. 
Mm-hmm. Have you ever been in the, the Haskell Free Library in Derby Line, any of you folks? Mm-hmm. It's a library that you can literally cross between Canada and the United States a dozen times as you go from one shelf to another in the library. And the theater that they have there um, is a beautiful old fashioned opera house. If you're on the stage, you're in Canada, but if you're in the audience, you're in the United States. (laughs) So imagine how complicated that is for a band that goes on tour. (laughs) Uh, It's a funny thing. But that's just one of the one one of the quirky things about the latitude system that we have. Okay, so let me get to the next question. Let me take that meridian out. It's not helping us much. It's not showing us the degrees. So I'm going to take it out. We know where it is. The North Star is where the meridian is, Polaris. So that's all we need. And now, so if you guess that moving farther south would put Andromeda's galaxy inside of our circumpolar circle. Sorry, but that was not the right guess. But if we were to move north, check this out. Now, at the 57th parallel, so to speak, which puts us somewhere around Hudson Bay. In fact, if you know, don't know where it is, look at the map on Stellarium and see that arrow. We're like polar bear land, guys. Be careful out there. We're in polar bear land, and if you lived in polar bear land, you might think you can see Andromeda's galaxy all year round because it's inside of your circumpolar circle. But did you notice something else happening to the sky as I move farther north? What's happening? It's getting brighter. But it's 3.30 in the morning. Mm -hmm. Let's go back to midnight. Surely there's no place that would be bright at midnight, right? Let's put it at 1 a.m. because of daylight savings time. Oh no, I'll, I'll leave it at, I'll do midnight, why not? So surely everybody's dark at midnight, right? Let's keep going north. That circumpolar circle, it's getting larger. Uh-oh, the sky's getting brighter. It's midnight. And we've entered the land of the midnight sun. Do you know what circle we are inside of? Notice the circumpolar circle. <laughs> it's almost the entire sky. But the bummer is that you're not, this is not gonna help you see Andromeda's galaxy because the sun will be out for half of the year. We are now inside of the Arctic circle. And if you are in the Arctic circle, even now in April, you are in the period of 24 hour daylight. And, uh, Forget about seeing the constellations if you're in that situation. Mm-hmm. But uh, let me uh, show you what that might look like. Hold on a second. I'm gonna put take that circumpolar line out of the sky. I don't think we need it at this moment. But check this out. Now, where's the sun? In the north. Let's go through the day. It's midnight. so. What's that following the sun? Venus. How cool is that? But wait, now the sun is coming towards the northeast. Oh, okay. Now it's rising higher so we can see it. But wait a minute. Is the sun actually rising? Or it's kind of like cruising along the horizon? Now, this is April. Have you heard about the land of the midnight sun? That's what the Vikings called the land in the Arctic Circle, including Iceland, which is a place that they colonized uh, back in medieval times. But imagine that midday, look, it's noon and the sun is in the south. That's true for us too. But let's keep going through the day. Oh no. That pesky sun. And this is in April. Do you want to see what it looks like in June? during the summer solstice time. Here, I'll put us on June 21st, the longest day of the year for people who live in the Northern Hemisphere. But imagine if you lived inside the Arctic Circle. Well, it surely wouldn't look like that. I've got to change the landscape. Otherwise, you're going to think trees can grow up there. But trees cannot grow that far north. It's simply too cold and there's not enough light. So maybe I'll 
find something that looks better. Oh, no, still too many trees. Just put a zero horizon. It's not that fun. It looks like Minecraft. But this is how you can use Stellarium to have a flat horizon, see? But this is what it would be like if you were in Greenland or north of the Arctic Circle in Iceland on the longest day of the year, fast forward through time. Here, maybe I'll put us at the bottom of the well and we'll see how funny this is. That's Venus, by the way. Remember that that's what's highlighted. So imagine if you lived in the Arctic Circle and you wanted to go to sleep, but you had a hard time sleeping when the sun is out. <laughs> Good luck with that. So when do you think the sun will finally go away? Who wants to predict it? Oh, what's this thing, by the way, that seems to have the moon? The moon is going to do something very strange. I wonder if any can predict it. Oh. If you remember one of the, the basic principles of the full moon, you might get a funny notion about what happens to people who live in the Arctic Circle during the time of a full moon. Where'd the moon go? Oh. Mm -hmm. See what's happening to it? Remember that a full moon has to be on the opposite side of the sky from the sun. So the closer the moon is to being full, the, the harder it's going to be to see because it's going to be on the opposite side from where the sun is. And if you're in the Arctic summer and you can see the sun all the time, then that means that for about six months, you will not see the full moon. So you get all this extra sunlight, but you get no full moon for half a year. Wah. <laughs> but would the full moon be that big of a deal if it's always bright? So... I hope you're not getting dizzy. You've just spent several months in a few seconds. I hope you're okay. I hope you're not hungry. But does anybody want to tell me a prediction as to when that sun might actually get out of the sky? Um, October. Ah, why'd you pick October? I don't know. Maybe because it's six months in the future, right? Well, you figure this is, it can't be permanent, right? So what happens in October? Well, it's actually a couple of days before October. So what I'm trying to do for you folks is to redefine the seasons in your mind. If you live in the Arctic, summer and winter are completely different things. Basically, summer, if you live in the Arctic Circle, summer means sunlight and winter means darkness. So would it be fair to say that if you live in the Arctic Circle, daytime is roughly six months long and nighttime is six months long? Yeah. Oh, look, it's now getting into July and do you see the moon is starting to appear again? The moon, as the moon starts to wane, it means it gets closer to the direction of the sun and maybe you're getting a little hypnotized or dizzy. So instead, I'll just jump a few days in the future. See the moon as it wanes, it gets closer to the direction of the sun. And we're about to see a new moon. So when the moon is in its crescent phases, waning crescent over here, waxing crescent over there, see? That's when you can see the moon in the Arctic. Oops, I just jumped too many days in the future. But... But when the moon starts to get past the quarter phase, when it starts to get more than half a moon, it will be out of your sight. So you won't get to see the biggest phases of the moon during the summer in the Arctic. But let's put it on July 21st. And then instead of going around circles and circles, I, I, I hope nobody's nauseous out there. Let's just jump a month and look at the height of the sun above the horizon and watch this. Ah, that's August, September 21st. Watch this. Finally, I can go to sleep. 
six months of being away. But Pretty this is true. Yeah, but wait. Okay, so now it's 10 o'clock. The sun finally went down. Is it going to be down for long? It would be very weird to live in a place like Valbard. Valbard is the farthest north place where people live permanently. And look at that. At 3 o'clock in the morning, the sun is coming back. So in September, you get daytime and nighttime. But the nighttime is a couple hours long. And the daytime is going to be like 20 hours long. So weird, right? And then let's jump into October. Uh-oh. A permanent twilight. Uh-oh. I keep hitting the wrong buttons. Hold on, guys. Sorry. Let me set this up. Ooh. It, did you see where the sun got closest to being visible? What direction? Okay, that's October. What about November? Oh, I saw I saw light for an hour. What about December? And we're not even at the North Pole. We're just in the Arctic Circle. People actually live in places where this happens, folks. So does anybody get the point about what's the benefit? I mean, what, what do you get in compensation? You don't see the sun for months, but the moon is permanent, is out for 24 hours when it's full. Or in the, like the waxing gibbous or the waning gibbous phases too. So watch that moon as it stays above the horizon for several days. Isn't that crazy seeing the sun flash for a second, but the moon never leaving the sky? So you've spent the winter in the Arctic Circle. Do you notice what star doesn't look like it's moving at all? The North Star. Polaris. So we're not exactly at the North Pole, but nobody really lives that far north, except for Santa Claus. So that is too far north for most observations. But if I did take you to the North Pole, well, guess what the latitude would be? It can't be any higher than 90. So that's a mistake there, here. Guess where we are now? We're on, let's see if it, if it accepts that data. I don't think it actually let me do it. All right, I think we're on the North Pole. Oh, it, it won't, look at that. It won't let me go higher than 87. Seriously, come on. 89, okay, that's close enough. That's one, you're one degree away. Okay, so if you're at, this place is as far from the North Pole as Bradford is from the Canadian border. Look at it that way. We're one degree off. And if I do that fast forward through time, check out the Polaris right in the middle of the top of the sky. What would be the size of your circumpolar circle? It would be the entire sky. So think of what constellations are not visible from here. Maybe I should slow it down so you can read. Uh oh, look what happens if you live in the North Pole. You'll never see Sirius and you'll only see Orion's torso, but never his belt. Wah. So think of how this is a very different view of the sky and hope that this makes a lot of sense to you now when I put in the line for the ecliptic. The sun has to be amongst the constellation of Pisces or Aries or Taurus or Gemini or Cancer or Leo 
for it to be visible. And which of those constellations is the highest one? Gemini. That's where the sun is during the summer solstice. So this, remember that this is the sky all the time. All these stars are always visible, but when the sun is in front of them, you can't see it. So by messing around with Stellarium and going to the North Pole and putting up the ecliptic line, I hope you realize what I'm showing you is the path that the sun will be taking when it is visible. And the fact that you only see that sliver of the ecliptic line shows you that you're missing the sun when it's anywhere else in the zodiac. So here's one, two, three, four, five, six constellations of the zodiac. And you know that there's 12 of them total. And right here is Virgo, partly visible. So if you lived in the North Pole, you would only know Persephone's arm and her head, but you would never see Spike. Does it make sense? Well, we've taken a trip to the North Pole. It's time to feed the sled dogs and check our victuals and our provisions. No, seriously, it is about 4.07. So maybe right now is a good time for everybody to stop what they're doing, stand up and stretch. Let me give you about, you know, four minute break or so. And we're gonna resume about 4.11. But I want everybody to do something physical with their bodies. I might run outside to the trampoline. You don't have to run around the room, Rose. It's not your birthday anymore. But anybody, whatever you want to do, just give yourself a break, drink some water, use the restroom, take a break, stretch your arms. I can't do any of you, so I, I assume you're all doing that. Take advantage of the short break, because when I get back, we're going to travel to the opposite side of the world and look at what the South Pole and the Southern constellations look like. Keep yourself hydrated. Someone shut this freezing in here. It was stupid. I didn't open it anyway. No, I don't expect you to open it or shut it. Rose, you can just leave the window. What? Just leave it.
All right, I'm back. I see Seamus asked a good question. I would say that probably the place where you would see Andromeda's galaxy the most is Northern Canada. All right, it sounds awfully quiet out there. Are you folks back or did I not let you have enough time for a break? We're back, I'm back. All right. I'm back. Okay. I'm back. <laughs> All right, thanks Moses. All right. Where can you see the Aurora Borealis is uh, Sadie's question. Well, you can see them here in Vermont, but we, live so far south that we don't usually get to see them more than maybe at best 50 nights of the year. But then is it going to be cloudy or is it going to be clear on one of those 50 nights? Is it going to happen at 9 p.m. when everybody might be outside or is it going to happen at 3 a.m. in the winter when nobody's going to be outside too cold and everybody's in their house? So we actually don't get them very often, but you can see them in Vermont. And the farther north you go, the more likely you are to see them. So if you are in the Arctic Circle and it's winter, so it's dark at night, like Iceland in the north or you know Scandinavia or Canada or Russia, if you're in those latitudes in the Arctic Circle, you get a really good show. In fact, I should show you a website um, that you kids would probably be uh, you know, a good place to visit on a regular basis. It's a website that I use as a resource. It's called spaceweather.com. And it's a great place to find out what's happening with Northern Lights, Auroras, Borealis, and whether there's sun storms and sunspots that might cause Northern Lights. And if anybody is uh, taking cool pictures of things in the sky, they will post it on spaceweather.com often. So let me show you that website. You could visit it anytime you wanna find out what the chances are of seeing an Aurora. In fact, you can even sign up for free emails that they'll send you when they think there's a chance of seeing uh, actual Northern Lights. And there's a group of people, a, a group of kids that I found out about through this website. There's a group of kids the same age as the kids that I teach here. Here they are, the kids that run a group that's called Earth to Sky Calculus. Do you see what they've done here? They created a balloon that can go up to 65 miles into space. That's not quite the definition of space, They'd have to go up 100 miles to be technically in space. But can you see that they took a picture with their little invention above the atmosphere so they could see the black sky and the stars and the blue sky below them? If you go on the website for this, this group of kids, it started off as a middle school math club. That's why it's called Sky Calculus. And they figured out that they could raise some money and get helium balloons and start launching these things. And what they do is they put a camera, a GPS tracker, a parachute, a whole rig, so they can launch it up into the sky. And then once it gets to a certain altitude, the balloon will pop and the whole thing will come plummeting down. A parachute will open and it'll slow it down, but it could land many, many miles away from where they launched it. So then they have to use the GPS tracker to find the thing. Um, and I've heard some really funny stories that came uh, from, this happening. In fact, they actually launched a balloon during a solar eclipse that happened a couple summers ago. And they were able to see the shadow of the moon. Can you believe that? They could see the size of the moon shadow, which is about 70 miles wide. And they were able to, you know, take a picture and videotape as their probe went through the shadow of the moon and then it plummeted back down. But this little thing selling a Mother's Day charm is a way that they make money. 
they uh, they sell it for a hundred bucks, and this this pays for the cost of their helium and the supplies that they use to do this. So, I one of my dreams, maybe this group of kids that I'm talking to would be the perfect group of kids to start this. Is what we if we could do something like this in Vermont, how fun would that be? Unfortunately, we're so close to the ocean, to the east and lakes and all that, that the good chance that our balloons would pop and land in some body of water, and then we may never get them again. But Does anybody have any questions about this? No? Well, anyway, I'm gonna move on, but that's the website that you should check out to find out if there's gonna be Aurora. So, so distracted with Earth to Sky Calculus. By the way, there is a comet called Swan that may become visible to the naked eye, but it's all a matter of how bright it becomes. Uh, so sometimes we get disappointed when these comets are predicted and they end up not being as bright, but you can see that people who use telescopes can take pictures and uh, Rosie and Rainey that you have a telescope, maybe you should plan on trying to get a view of this comet It'll be happening in May, so you have plenty of time to practice getting uh, used to using your telescope. So, anybody have any questions? I didn't expect to spend that much time on the auroras, but that's one of the best things about being in the Arctic or the Antarctic, is that you get to see that aspect of the Earth. And the reason why those auroras happen at the northern and southern poles and not so much near the equators is because of the fact that that's where the magnetic field of our planet emanates from. And there's actually some kind of weak spots there where the electricity from the sun can get down and tickle the gases in our atmosphere and it causes them to glow. Now, I don't have all the equipment with me, but I used to be able to simulate that by taking a Tesla coil, which shoots out electrons. And I would have a compact fluorescent bulb in my other hand. And even though nothing would be touching, you could see the gases glowing inside the light bulb from the electricity coming from the Tesla coil. So imagine replacing the Tesla coil with the sun during a solar storm, shooting off electrons by the gajillions. And imagine that the light bulb having gases trapped inside of glass is an analog for our atmosphere. And then you can imagine that those particles make our atmosphere glow when the electrons from the sun hit it, but they tend to concentrate their impacts at the North and South Pole. So you could imagine that's why that part of the atmosphere is glowing. And if you live by the equator, that effect is is none is null and void because of the fact that the magnetic field is very strong there and those particles can't get through on that part of the earth but have i told any of you guys about the 1859 super flare the carrington uh flare uh i think so okay never heard of it well, I just want to mention this because this is all connected to the auroras and to give you an idea of what could be a, a bad situation if it happened in modern times. Those of you who haven't heard about it, you can look up a guy named Lord Carrington. Sometimes it's called the Carrington event. And to make a long story short, Lord Carrington was a British man who was obsessed with studying the sun. And he had this really cool device called a heliostat, which basically is a mirror lens contraption that follows the sun throughout the day and projects a constant image of the sun on, uh, on a surface, in this case, on the floor of his house. So there was a room in his house where if you walked in on a sunny day, not every day in Britain, but the days where the sun would show, you would see the sun projected on the floor, like huge, like several feet across. And at that time, People were trying to study the sunspots and see if they could use them to learn about the sun. So he would lay out big sheets of paper on the floor and draw the sunspots. By the way, if you looked at space weather, there are no sunspots right now. That's a reason why you might not see, not likely to see any auroras anytime soon, because sunspots are basically caused by storms on the sun. The bigger the sunspots, the more storm, the bigger the storm, and the more likely you could get an event that causes an aurora. Well. Lord Carrington was sketching the sun. He was drawing some sunspots and he noticed that one of the sunspots that he was drawing suddenly blew up and became bright, brighter than the entire sun. So bright that 
all of the rest of the sun and the sunspots that he could see were washed out by the light. Now, he wrote about it, he described it in his journal, but at that time, nobody understood what that could mean and he didn't have the internet and he couldn't post it on Twitter and Instagram being like, whoa, man, hashtag amazing. I just saw the sun blow up on my floor. He didn't have that way to distribute that information. So he may have been one of the only people who noticed this flare happening on the sun. But everybody in the world noticed what happened about 18 hours later. 18 hours later, the entire planet got auroras. If you lived in Cuba, if you lived in the tropics, if you lived in places that were nowhere near the North Pole, you got to see auroras. Everybody got to see auroras. The whole world was Northern Lights. It wasn't Northern and Southern, it was global lights for a short period of time. And that was the most of it for most people. But in some countries like the United States and other rich countries at the time, this was 1859, there was only one electronic device that anybody in the world ever used at that time. Does anybody know what it is? Light bulb. That wasn't invented yet. Mm. I'll, I'll give you a hint. Mm -hmm. <laughs> when my phone goes off with a text message, I actually, it makes a sound of this ancient device. <laughs> Oh, um, the telephone or Morse code or um... Morse code was used to use it, was, in, was invented to use it. A telegraph machine, yes. In 1859, most people did not use anything that used electricity. The only devices that were around that anybody might see that were relied on electricity in 1859, this is two years before the Civil War, just to give you an idea. It was the telegraph machine and it was a very new thing. And there were only a small number of telegraph machines around the country. There was only a short number of uh, you know, cables that were connected to each other. So if you were in Boston, you could send a telegraph to New York or from New York, you could send one to Washington DC, maybe to Chicago, but there wasn't like a global internet by any sense of the word. Telegraph was still very new. And when that super flare happened, not only did the world have global lights, but all those telegraph machines started going off like crazy on their own. The people who were operating them, the, 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 you know, the telegraph operators, places like Western Union were freaking out and they didn't know what to do. So they unplugged the batteries because there wasn't electricity in the grid. There was no grid, there was no outlets. They only had batteries. They unplugged all the batteries and the telegraph machines continued to work. <laughs> and it was very strange. There were messages sent from city to city where the telegraph operator is saying, I am operating under no power. Are you receiving this message? And somebody on the other end would be like, yes, we're receiving the message. And we've also disconnected our batteries. The machine is acting so strange. And you imagine people had only been using telegraph machines for a few years. So maybe this was a bug in the system that they didn't know about. They had no idea that it was actually caused by the sun. But that was 1859. What would happen if the sun did that to us today? Well, doesn't the entire economy rely on the internet, basically? Yeah, uh, that's uh, true. All electronic things would go haywire. Yeah, they would be useless. The, what the sun did to our planet is what uh, you could also call an electromagnetic pulse, an EMP which is something that the military has used in, in ways um, on a small scale. If you fire off a device that makes an EMP, everything electronic stops working. Not like it's dead battery, but like it's dead. Like it will never work again. You're frying the inside of the electronics. It's like taking everything and putting it in the microwave and it's not gonna work when it comes back out again. So an EMP on a small scale can do that. A nuclear weapon can be designed to create one of those and cause that, but this was a global EMP. And scientists have been aware that this could happen. I talked to a scientist, his name is Mark Draper, and he used to work at IBM, and he was involved in designing microchips and tiny electronic circuits. And he said that, yeah, we know that all of these things that we design will be completely useless if there was one of those solar flares. 
if you want to have a phone that fits in your pocket like this, you have to give up on those nice features. But if you want to make a phone that is solar flare proof, it would have to be probably this big so that it would have enough shielding around it to prevent, this is just my Clorox wipes, my, my best friend when I go out into town. But so can you see why we're kind of vulnerable? We have satellites that are staring at the sun like SOHO and the Solar Dynamic Observatory. So if there was one of these solar flares, scientists all around the world would probably know within minutes. But do you remember how long it took for that solar flare's pulse to reach the earth? Wait, I have a question. Please. Since, um, since light takes eight minutes to reach earth, you said that it took 18 hours for the massive global solar flare to happen. Why is that? Was it light? Mm, mm, I don't think so, but what was it? So yeah, this is a great question, Seamus, and I'm so glad you asked it because if light was that what caused it, then yes, we would have had eight minutes of warning and then we would have hit us. But what hit us wasn't light from the sun. The light was what caused Mr. Carrington, Lord Carrington to see the flare. But what hit us was actually, well, what carries electricity? Electrons. Electrons, right. So electrons have mass. And when the sun shoots them out, it doesn't have the ability to accelerate them to the speed of light. They, there's just not that much energy in that explosion, but it does accelerate them to ridiculously fast speeds. So it's like a cannon going off. It's not as fast as light. So instead of taking eight minutes, it still takes 18 hours, but that's because it's mass of particles that are heading towards you. So it's kind of like getting hit by a lightning bolt from the sun in a way, but it doesn't look like a lightning bolt. It would actually be invisible. Electrons don't uh, appear unless they charge something. So you would not have seen the electrical field heading your way, but as soon as it touched the atmosphere, it made the entire atmosphere glow like a neon light. Think about it that way. That's why everybody saw the auroras. The entire air was electrified by this current and the air conducted that current to everywhere in the world. One interesting fact that was discovered by this was that there is a compound of nitrogen. At, the atmosphere is mostly nitrogen. I hope you all know that. And there's a compound of nitrogen that forms when lightning uh, happens. I forget what it's called. If it, It's not nitrogen dioxide because that's toxic. But there is a nitrogen solid that forms on the ground when lightning strikes the air. It takes the nitrogen in the air and the electricity causes a new molecule to form. When that global EMP 1859 Carrington super flare happened, the entire world got a little bit of this nitrogen compound dust. It's like the world got a little dusting of fertilizer. And when they discovered that, they went into the I uh, Arctic ice cores, the same ice cores that we use to study climate change. And they noticed that they could see these little layers of gray dust that were made of that same nitrogen compound and they were evenly distributed throughout the ice core. And on average, they happen once every 800 years. So we actually know in a, in a crude way that these things happen regularly. Once every 800 years doesn't mean that it's going to be 650 years from now when this happens. It, things like that are random. It could happen twice in the same year. But on average, it happens only once every 800 years. So here's a great question coming from Hazel. And um, you said, what would happen to the people on the ISS? Well, would you want to be on the ISS when that happens? <laughs> well, Luckily, <laughs> yeah. Dead. You, you, you could actually, like it could, the electricity could get so bad that you could be fried, like literally electrocuted inside of that spacecraft. I don't know the exact numbers, but I do know that they have that 18 hour window. And because NASA is always constantly studying the sun too, the first thing that would probably happen from NASA's point of view would be to like shut down as many satellites as possible to keep their electronics as safe as possible if, po if it is possible to save them. And they would tell all those astronauts to hop inside those Soyuz lifeboats and head back to earth. They have a procedure on the International Space Station where they can evacuate it in a matter of minutes 
if necessary. And there's a lot of things that could cause them to have to evacuate it. Nobody's had to do that in 20 years. So that's a good thing. But there could be a meteor strike, a satellite debris, space junk uh, thing. There's a million, or they could have a failure, like something breaks on the space station and makes it uninhabitable. So they already have procedures and they've all been trained and drilled on how to get into the capsule and get off of that space station as quickly as possible. Luckily, they would probably have several hours. But think about what else would happen. You would have to have every airplane land. You would have to have every car stop driving and park because anything electronic would be out of control. So imagine how terrible that could be. If you were driving a car and all of a sudden the solar flare hits and your car is rolling down the road, but your brakes and nothing else works. It's just a rolling ball of steel now. So what happened to the economy? <laughs> well, maybe this is a good time to talk about that in the time that we're in now, because all of us would be Amish <laughs> overnight, mm -hmm. meaning we would all basically be relying on candles and lanterns. Um, only the only electrical devices that would work would be really, really crude things like, you know, you could probably get a car battery and make a light bulb work, but you probably wouldn't be able to do anything more complicated than that. Maybe an electric motor that was really built sturdily out of rugged materials, like an old fashioned one, but then how would you power it? Cause the grid would be broken. You know, you probably wouldn't be able to even have power in your house. Your circuit breakers might work, but the, the power company's electronic system for transmission would be frozen. So you wouldn't be able to get power. So if, even if you lived off the grid, you, you still need all those electronics to control your solar panels, the charge controllers, the inverters. Those are really delicate electronics. So you would have your batteries. You can make heat with a battery. You can make a crude light bulb with a battery, but you wouldn't do, uh, be able to do much else. And your cell phone? Well, if that ever happened, all of these would become very attractive ceramic tiles that we could put our showers and our on our countertops because they would be useless for anything else. So is that something that worries you? <laughs> now it does. <laughs> Sorry, we have enough things to worry about. I'm not trying to add to your sources of anxiety. So uh, like let's just me. look at it this way. There's a lot of people who are working on this. A lot of organizations and the national, you know, are our military, our, our, our federal government, FEMA actually has a plan for what to do if something like this happens. That doesn't mean it's gonna be fine and dandy. It just means that there are people who have thought about this and there are certain electronics that can be made safe. But if those of you who have heard of, heard of things like Faraday cages and all of that, you would need to do a lot of building to make your house flare proof. So I, I don't think it would be practical. You'd have to make your house into something that looked like a chain link fence. All around so another thing <clears throat> one time wasn't there a solar flare that reached out all the way to the orbit of earth and if earth had been in that spot it would have reached earth yes i think you're talking about something that happened maybe 2012 a few years ago they discovered with our we have these satellites like soho and the sdo and also stereo which is a pair of satellites that are on opposite sides of the sun. And NASA's goal has been for a while now to have a, a, a view of every side of the sun, not just the side that's facing the earth. And because of that, we were able to observe a solar flare that was of the same strength as a Carrington super flare, but it fired off in the opposite direction or not the opposite, but just a different direction that missed the earth completely. What if that had hit us? Well, we wouldn't be doing this on Zoom. We'd be doing it by a campfire. <laughs> so we'd be, we'd be back in connection with our ancient ancestors. We'd all be living in a non-electronic world for at least a few months until people were able to make new stuff. So not, don't worry, guys. Don't start freaking out about that end of the world scenario. Look at it this way. <clears throat> Think of how long people have lived in Vermont before electricity. 12,000 years from the, the, the hunter gatherers that came during the ice age to the farmers that came here from Scotland with not much more than their clothes and their shoes and a pocket full of seeds. And they were able to live here without electricity. So 
we can manage. It won't be the end of the world. It'll just be the end of the internet for a while. <laughs> and some people think they can't live without that, but we have survived before the internet. So we can do it again. Well, boy, that took a long time. I'm sorry, folks. I didn't realize how much time had gone by. But let's go back to Stellarium. Let's talk about happy things for a moment here. Okay, we're really like far out of where we're supposed to be in time and space. So let me uh, see if I can get us back to now. Oh, we're still in the Arctic. Oh, what have I done? I'm gonna, I'm gonna quit the program. Sometimes the easiest thing to do is just to quit Stellarium and reload it um, because then all your default settings will be back and I don't have to put back in all that latitude stuff. So let me do that again. Now we're gonna see Stellarium reloaded. All right, so we talked a lot about being in the Arctic. Let's take a trip to the Antarctic or the Southern Hemisphere. So let me go through the into the night and we're gonna be heading south. Maybe something good for you to focus your mind on is where Orion is in the sky. Remember we're about 45 degrees north latitude, so now we're gonna go south, which means our latitude is gonna go down. Look what's happening to Orion. Now we're getting close, we're in the tropics, we're in the Caribbean. See that arrow? Now we're on the Northern coast of South America. We're getting close to the equator. Notice what the latitude is at the equator. How far up is the North Star at the equator? It's, it's, it's literally behind the N. So I'm sorry, folks. Polaris is actually there somewhere. There it is. <laughs> but if you lived on the equator, would you be able to see the North Star ever? No. And look at what Orion looks like. So watch this, if you have the equator, I can say Ecuador, a country named for the equator, then watch what happens as Orion goes to bed. Do you notice anything funny about how the stars are moving? Let's look south. Okay, that kind of looks normal. So let's look east. Did anybody notice a funny thing? No? Well, Maybe this will kind of moving around in an exact, they're not really, I don't know how to explain it. Well, I'm gonna do a quick change from Vermont, boom. Look at the North Star. See how those lines are all angled in a funny way? So these lines kind of represent the paths of the stars in that direction of the sky. So they all kind of go across the sky at a funny angle. They rise up in the north and go towards the south and then rise. And then as they set, they go back towards the north. But if you're at the equator, look at what happens. The stars will rise straight up in the east and go straight down in the west. Uh, actually, I have a simplified way to, to, show, to describe this to you. It might be kind of confusing. Um, but this goes back to when we talked about Eratosthenes. Do you remember that fellow? Anybody remember Eratosthenes? Ring a bell? Please, um, yeah. please, somebody. The guy who measured the earth by yes. the well, right? Yes, he measured the earth because he saw the, the sun reflected at the bottom of the well and he realized that that didn't happen where he lived. Well, I've always wondered how did Eratosthenes get the idea that the earth should be round? Uh, there's a lot of, of people even before his time that had established that. It was established maybe like 500 BC by some philosophers that the earth was round, but you have to wonder 
Where did they get the idea? I know the earth is round. I could watch a satellite video of a satellite going around the earth and I can see that, see the pictures that the astronauts take, but they didn't have that back then. So I'm gonna show you some pictures that come from an old astronomy textbook that will kind of give you an idea of what might have inspired Eratosthenes to realize that the world was round. Do you see this view of the globe? This is how our sky seems to move. And in ancient Greek times, people thought that the earth was fixed at the center and that the sky was moving around us. So they had this concept of the celestial sphere. But if you lived in a place like Vermont, by the way, 45th parallel is also close to where Cannes in France is, which is on the Mediterranean. So ancient Greek peoples, even though they had a much different climate than we do, they saw a very similar type of sky to what we see in the Northern United States. That's the same latitude as the Northern Mediterranean, believe it or not. It's not the same weather, but it's the same rough latitude. So they saw the sky move this way. And if you look at the bottom of this picture, you can see the sun at its height during the summer solstice. And do you see the sun at its lowest part during the winter solstice? And does this picture help you understand why it's the opposite for the Southern hemisphere? When the sun is at our summer solstice position, it's in their winter solstice position and vice versa. I know we've covered this before, but this is a weird way to see it. This is sort of like an ancient Greek idea of what the sky would look like. And if you look at the top picture, you can see the height of the sun on the winter solstice down low and at the summer solstice up high. But, oops, sorry, that's, that's another map of the new. That's from this latitude, but what if you lived in other places? So remember how we saw the circumpolar circle was the size of the entire sky if you're at the North Pole and how the stars and the sun and the moon don't go up and down, but more like round and round around the, the sky horizon. Well, look at what happens at the equator. It's quite the opposite. Everything goes straight up and then straight down. And that's because of that part of the earth. So the reason why I mentioned this map, oh, I'll go back to this, is because Eratosthenes made this map. And of course the world is bigger than this map. But when I look at this map, I notice a couple of things. Do you see the bottom of the map where it says, Cinnamomophora region, the place where cinnamon comes from. That's the Horn of Africa. That's roughly where Somalia is now. And do you see the northernmost part on his map where it says Thule or Baltia? That's roughly Sweden or Norway in Scandinavia. So even though Eratosthenes didn't know about the entire world, he knew of peoples from far north that would describe the sky moving in a particular way. If you live in Scandinavia, you're close to the Arctic Circle. They probably told him about the, the land of the midnight sun. Could you imagine what that would sound like to a guy who lives in Egypt? That never happens there. And then he may have met people from Nubia, the southern part of Egypt down south and into where Sudan is and Ethiopia is today. The ancient Greeks did trade with folks from Ethiopia. So they knew about places as far south as sub-Saharan Africa. And those stars are going to move like what you see in the tropics and the equator. So I have a, a hunch and I don't have all the historical, you know, documentation to back this up. So I'll say it's just a hunch, but I have a hunch that when Eratosthenes made this map, he probably talked to people from these different places and the way they described the sky moving probably gave him the evidence that perhaps we live on a round planet because these perspectives change dramatically based on how far north our stars. Oh, Seamus got to go. I'm sorry that he left. So we're almost done, guys. We're only about 15 minutes. So please, please, please. This is your chance for questions. I was to Moses. Oh, Moses. Okay, sorry, Moses. Uh, we miss you, bud, but it's nice. it was nice to have you on board. So anyway, I hope this idea makes sense the way that the sky moves varies based on where you live and you can't get more extreme than the North Pole or the South Pole compared to what we have with a part of the planet where we have a daytime and a nighttime. But if you put it all into a continuum, think about how long our days are in the summer, about 15 hours and only about nine hours of darkness. And think of how long our nights are during the winter when it's dark for about 15 hours and only bright for nine hours. And you can see that we have a great change, but it's not that dramatic. So 
I still haven't heard anybody tell me what's the significance of the Canadian border, that 45th parallel. It's halfway in between the equator and the North Pole. Yes, thank you, P. I know you've heard this before. So isn't that kind of kind of in a oversimplistic way, pretty cool way to describe where we where we live? We live halfway between the North Pole and the equator. And in the summer, it gets hot as the equator here. You might think you're in the tropics on a 95 degree day in Vermont summer. You'll be like, this is Vermont. It feels like I'm in the Amazon rainforest. And then comes January and you expect a polar bear to sneak up on you because it's so cold here that you would think that we live in the Arctic. So look at it this way. You live in a place where you can experience the greatest range of Earth's uh, temperatures from the hots of the tropics to the cold of the Arctic and you don't have to travel. All you gotta do is live in Vermont for a whole year and you get to see the world's uh, weather <laughs> come to you. I always like to think about that. There's, there's the only place I can think of that's more extreme than where we live as far as seasonal change is the Gobi Desert in Mongolia, where it can get down to like 50 or 70 below zero sometimes in the winter. And then in the summer, it can be 120 degrees Fahrenheit. And you know what animals evolved in that landscape? Horses. Think of a horse as an animal that's adapted to the greatest extremes of heat and cold and why horses were able to be traveled, you know, taken to every climate in the world. Horses can survive almost anywhere because nowhere is as unpleasant as the Gobi Desert can be <laughs> in the winter and the summer. Everywhere else is a break for the horses or the planet Mercury. Wait a minute. <laughs> All right, Seamus, I get what you're saying, but we're not talking about moving to another planet. However, speaking of our planet, since we only have a few minutes left, unless somebody has a question that they want to ask, I'm going to go back to Stellarium to talk about the Southern Hemisphere just for a bit. So we're now poised on the equator where the North Star is not visible, but what is visible are many stars and constellations that you will not see from Vermont. And actually, I'm going to show you something really cool. I'm going to take you to a place that's opposite of Vermont's latitude, New Zealand. Vermont is 45 degrees north latitude, and there's New Zealand, 45 degrees south latitude. So you've got to wait a little longer to make the sunset. But if you lived in New Zealand, look at what Orion looks like. upside down and think about how the you couldn't see a lot of the stuff below orion in our sky but if you lived in new zealand you would see this whole region of the sky to the south is something that we cannot see from vermont and they also get to see the best part of the milky way let me see if i can show you an even darker night so here we are staying up all night in New Zealand, where right now it's fall. And you guys recognize the dark, dusty lanes of the Milky Way up here? Yep. Well, cultures in the Southern Hemisphere have done something that nobody in the North that I've ever heard of has been able to do. In fact, according to the Andy Mountains in South America, this dark shape is a llama. Can you see its two eyes looking at you? Those are just very bright stars in the in the centaur. In fact, one of them is, this is Alpha Centauri's home, by the way. That's the closest star system to the sun. Mm -hmm. Do you see how it looks like a llama looking at you with two eyes? And here's his long neck and his body. Yeah. It's not. It's not the easiest thing to see, but What's so cool is that I know of two examples of cultures in the Southern Hemisphere that have made up pictures, not with stars, but with the dark clouds of dust in the Milky Way. And the, the people of the Andes Mountains, like the Quechua speaking people, of the, the people who were once part of the Inca Empire, have a llama that they see in the stars in that dusty part. And if you go to Australia and you talk to the Aborigine people, they say it looks like an emu which is a bird that is native to Australia. So if you go to Southern cultures that see the brightest part of the Milky Way, 
they have taken advantage of that and created a different kind of star picture, a constellation not made of bright stars, but of dark dust. And you could say that's a different kind of asterism, but something unique. I've never heard of cultures in the Northern hemisphere of doing anything like that. But then again, we don't get to see the best part of the Milky Way the way they do, but also the constellations. I'm gonna to try to make it visible so you can see the whole sky is seen from a place like New Zealand. Do you recognize any constellations? Sure. They're, they're gonna see the ones of the Zodiac just like we do, see the line going through Scorpius, Sagittarius, Libra, Virgo, okay? But remember the way Virgo looked in our sky from Vermont? We, don't, we didn't get to see a whole lot below her. We could see Corvus, the little crow. We could see Hydra. But this centaur is completely invisible to us here in Vermont because it's covered by the land. So I want you to imagine in your head drawing a line across the sky and the southern half or the lower half of that circle would be invisible to you. The half would be visible. So New Zealand gets to see some of the constellations that we do, and then they get all these others that we don't get to see. And here's a cool thing right here. <clears throat> see this ship? The, if you go to the Mediterranean and you sail far south in the Mediterranean to like Egypt, you can see this on the horizon. So at certain times of the year, the ship looks like it's sitting on the ocean. But that's only if you're in the southern Mediterranean. And the, the Greeks named this ship the Argo, after Jason and the Argonauts. But in modern times, the International Astronomical Union decided to break up this constellation into three separate pieces. And so Vela is the sail, Carina is the keel, and Pupis is the poop deck. So that explains that funny name, Pupis or Pupis is the poop deck. But I, I think I've mentioned this before, but I was wondering if anybody would notice looking at the constellations of the southern sky. Do you notice anything funny about any of them? We've talked about this before, but is there anything there that doesn't look like it belongs in the world of ancient peoples? Clock. A clock. A clock was not known in ancient Greek times. So who put that there? Well, it turns out that William Herschel is one of the people who created new constellations for the Southern Hemisphere. He and other people like uh, Captain Cook, the famous Captain Cook and Edmund Halley, they took uh, the knowledge of, of new locations and you know, as the British Empire was growing and expanding, British scientists from the Northern Hemisphere found themselves in locations in the tropics like Australia or Tahiti in places where they saw completely different stars. So as the maps of the Southern sky started getting distributed to people in Britain and other parts of Europe in the 1700s, they wanted to fill in the gaps and fill in the constellations that they, they found. So they made up new names for them. And sometimes they used modern devices like a clock or orologium. And if you look around, you'll see the painting, the painter's easel. And there's also uh, a microscope amongst these constellations. Let me just take a look at them out so you can see. There's microscopium. That should be the official constellation of the STEM lab, right, Leela? But we can't see it from Vermont. And then let me ask you this. Do you think it really looks like a microscope there? <laughs> So sometimes constellations are a reach, a big stretch. And sometimes they don't really look, you know, like, uh, like what they're supposed to look like. Sometimes when people made up constellations, they were just trying to fill in an empty spot, just like a zip code so that when something happened in that part of the sky, we could say, you know, over by that little star. No, not that one, but the one over to the left. No, 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 no. We could just say orologium. And then everybody would know you were talking about a specific part of the sky. So constellations were originally born out of a need for humans to illustrate the sky and tell stories. That's where the big ones like Leo, Orion, 
Ursa Major. Those are ones that people definitely saw and made up thousands of stories about. I don't know if anybody ever made up a story about cancer, the crab. I mean, back in prehistoric times. But when the Greeks were trying to make a calendar out of the stars, folks like Hipparchus of Rhodes said, wait, there's this big space in between Leo and Gemini. We got to put something there. We can't have the sun hanging out for a whole month with no constellation. So Cancer the Crab was kind of inserted there to give something to look at. But you could probably agree with me that Cancer the Crab doesn't look like much of a constellation at all. And I know that Hipparchus of Rhodes, who could be considered the father of Greek astrology, fortune telling, he was actually a good observer of the sky, but he created Aries and Libra so that there would be 12 constellations of the Zodiac because the Greeks thought that 12 was a, a, a sacred number. Think of the 12 gods of Olympus, the 12 notes of the, of the Western musical scale, 12 months of the year. So for the Greeks, 12 was holy and sacred. And so a Zodiac with anything other than 12 was wrong, even though there are cultures that had 15 constellations in the Zodiac or just 10. And I know that in India, the Zodiac is actually uh, like a dozen and a half, 18 or so constellations that look like women. They're like dancing ladies that the sun travels through. I don't know enough about that story. So if anybody has any information about uh, the star lore of India, that's another a whole entire continent's worth of culture that I would love to learn about. So now we're down to our last couple minutes, folks. And it's sad for me because I know that this means we only have one more class together before we say goodbye for the summer. So I remember I said at the beginning, I'm going to say it again. My hope is that for the next week, you come up with a great question and you can email them to me or to Leela, but the sooner the better. Just because if I get the questions at two o'clock on Wednesday next week, I might not have enough time to prepare uh, my answer and give you a good, uh, you know, good story there. But if you give me the questions earlier in the week or even better this week, by the end of the week, then I'll have enough time to do some research and find the answers to whatever questions you might ask. And I hope to get great questions. And I hope you realize that they're not just limited to what we've been talking about today, astronomy, but I want your questions to come from anything in the scientific world that you're curious about. It could even be about COVID-19, even though you probably have heard enough about this for your whole lives. You're, I understand that you kids might have information you need and you might want me to clarify things for you, maybe give you some perspective on what this is doing to our society compared to other times in history when humans have faced similar threats and challenges. So I'm sad to say goodbye, but I'm happy that all of you were able to join and think of great questions to ask and let's make our last class you know, a very exciting one with a lot of different topics. Great, thank you so much, Bobby, for all of your information. And uh, definitely, it sounds like you guys, you have a mission. Bring us some questions, feel free to email them to us. I'll put our emails in the notes that we send out um, and we'll see you next week. And just remember, it's, it'll be our last time. So <laughs> come we'll have a quest. Yeah. A quest. <laughs> all right, but thank you guys so much and we'll see you again next Wednesday. <laughs> All right, everyone be well, stay safe. Bye. Thank you. Uh, let me see if anybody. Bye. 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 Hey, Bobby. Yeah. We've been um, playing with Stellarium, but ours is super bare bones. Is there one that we could, do we have to purchase one? Like the, the program you have? How does, how does that work? Hmm. Um, Maybe it's just. Let me go to the website for a second because I just want to see why that is. I've never. Um, one we've been, the other versions. Okay, the one we've been playing in doesn't really, can't really change much. Huh. Wait a minute. Um, what kind of computer do you have? 